called to order the regular meeting for the Lemster Conservation Commission for June 13th, 2017. Our seven o'clock first hearing, uh, pursuant to Mass General Law, one sec chapter 131, section 40 as amended, there'll be a public hearing to consider a request for determination of applicability by the City of Lemonster regarding the widening of, a, of an existing stormwater spillway on the city-owned capped landfill. Water's work is proposed within the buffer zone of a bordering vegetated wetland address off Mechanic Street, map 445, lot one. Is there anybody here representing? I'll be representing the project. Okay. Um, this is a project proposed by the Monster Board of Health. Uh, and it's going to involve widening of a stormwater uh, spillway located on the northeast corner of the cap landfill. Um, if you ever drove down the, uh, the Flemster connector there, uh -huh. look, going towards the, say, the Boston uh, on-ramp, look to the right, you'll see quite a bit of erosion on that uh, landfill. Mm -hmm. um, so what they're proposing is you know, several fixes to, to some erosion spots. Um, for us, there's one over by some bordering vegetative wetland that's directly associated with the Nashville River uh, to the east. Um, it's outside the 200 foot um, riverfront area, but you know, we still have the 100 foot bordering vegetative wetland buffer. Um, so the project proposes to essentially remove 12 inches of topsoil. Um, from a 90 foot by 15 foot area, um, which is the mouth of the spillway, um, and implement uh, some large diameter riprap stone there. Um, if you saw any of the pictures I sent to you in an email, you can see you know, some of the existing erosion that's happening there. Um, and further down in the spillway, they're going to, again, widen it and Going to be, it's about a 130 foot section that will be removing another 12 inches of topsoil and replacing with uh, brick wrap stone. Um, proposed timeline is going to be you know, less than a week in order to, to do the work over there. Um, because it's a cap landfill, there is a membrane underneath the topsoil and some sand. Um, so what they're, you know, they're not proposing to disturb that membrane at all. It's a chain link fence that runs along the, the eastern side of that spillway. Um, pretty much put silt fence straw walls right along that uh, chain link fence, hook it around, and that should you know, be pretty ample for what they're proposing over there. Um, anybody has any questions? What's causing the erosion? Just um, improper channeling of stormwater. Okay. So that's why they want to widen it. Hopefully, you know, get rid of all those trouble spots where, where it's um, funneling, I guess you could say. So the northeast side, you get the riprap spillway. Mm -hmm. That's kind of in that small section that's blown up. Yep. You can see that. And what's down here at the bottom? Uh, closest to the connector here? Yes. Uh, it's going to be pretty much the same thing. Um, okay. You can see right now where it's all uh, pretty much channeled out from all that erosion. So they're going to be replacing the topsoil in that area. They're going to be used. That's the half stone area? Yes. What's it kind of eroded now? Exactly. Okay. And um, they're going to be using a geotextile membrane. It's kind of like a uh, honeycomb. Mm -hmm. And it'll be compacting the soil into that. And then the same to the east side there. That one in the middle, it's got like two areas right next That's to correct. Yeah. Okay. And some various other items. They'll be doing um, some wall heads 
replacing some damaged wall head casings in the area. Say monitoring well. You've been out there, Marco. Yeah. What um at the end of this looks like it's a hundred and thirty five foot long regrets wheel. Mm -hmm. Um what's it look like from that point to the BBW there? Do we still have a steep slope or pretty steep slope. And um, you know, I got the chain link fence that runs the, the tire length of that. It's, you know, it's pretty obvious where the BBW is down there. Yeah, I'm just having trouble visualizing um, where that, what's going to happen to that water once it gets to that point. I just want to make sure we're not shifting our problem to a different spot. That's all. Sure. Right. It, looks, it looks like you've already. It looks like you've already rip wrapped. Yeah. Well, it looks like the city's already rip wrapped some areas in the past, and of course, water is taking its natural course. And sure. Uh, create another problem and trying to fix that as well. Absolutely. Um, you know, this is what uh, we're in current came up with. Uh, you know, I, I think it's uh, pretty good for the situation down there currently. But how? Um, so from from the edge of that rip wrap to the BBW, how much height difference are we talking? Oh boy. Um, well, it's almost immediately there. That's the thing. It's well, it, in, in two dimensions, I see it's immediately there, but I'm having, right. again, I'm having a hard time seeing the topo. Yeah, you know, a couple feet. Ten. If that. <coughs> okay. Hard to gauge on site. Okay, yeah. so you're so you just a few feet from the. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they actually have a. No, they do not. But They're not showing a detail for that swell, are they? Yeah. Not, not very, not like. How should you say it? Not specific to what they're going to do over there, but they do show a kind of side profile of it. But it's definitely not to scale for what you know what they're proposing on the site. Are they going to use the, the non-woven geotextile underneath? The That's what they're calling for. I see that on the berm detail. I didn't see it on anywhere on the. Yeah, that's what they call for. Spill. Okay, I see it now. Spill the line. How thick is that cap? Um, it's 12 inches. Do they have a side profile of that? There's a 12 inch sand drainage layer, a 6 inch vegetative supportive layer, and then a 6 inch topsoil layer. Um, so you're talking 24 inches. Okay, to get the gap. So yeah, so you need to get this fixed quickly. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, no, to answer Dan's question earlier about another cause for this was overgrazing by um, some of the uh, the sheep, the sheep up there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and with the drought and all that, definitely did not help. So a lot of that um, support from the vegetation, you know, definitely didn't help with anything. And who would do this work? Um, is this a city project or does it go out to No, bid it's or? going up to bid. It's going out to bid. Right. Okay. Well, DPW won't be touching this. Is it ready to go out to bid now? or? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Once so it can, it can happen fairly soon. Yeah. Okay. They're hoping to start um, end of June, July time frame. Comments, questions? Anybody in the audience want to speak on this RDA? Second time and third and final time? Any objections closing the public hearing? All right, public hearing is now closed. Marco. What do you think? I think that uh, should issue a negative three determination of applicability 
uh, with the following added conditions that erosion controls to be placed as shown on the provided plans. Conservation agent shall be notified at least 24 hours prior to start work to allow for inspection of erosion controls. If anybody has any additional comments, we tap that on to conditions. Uh, I do not. I just want to reiterate that I truly want to see erosion controls, especially on that northeast corner, because that's so close to the wetlands. Absolutely. So. Not an added one, but just. Uh, do I have a motion? One last quick thing on oh, certain conditions. Sorry. Um, the, the specs have been done already. What are this drainage calc specs? Or no, the, the, the construction. Oh, as in bid specs? Yep. Um, we can't answer that. Okay. I mean, as, as a condition to this, I would like to see the design engineer um, just observe the installation of that, or perhaps will. Sure. Well, I sure definitely that. know it wouldn't occur. It's going to be on site. Yeah, I think say, okay. Well, I think we should just make note of it, too. Sure. That should be one other thing. All right, we'll do it. Do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I can recommend, excuse me. Alright. Allergies. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we issue uh, a negative predetermination for this project. Do I have a second? All in favor? Opposed? Abstain. All right. Very good, sir. Moving on to our 705 hearing, pursuant to, pursuant to Mass General Law, sec, Chapter 40, Chapter 131, Section 40, as amended, there will be a public <coughs> hearing to consider a request for determination of applicability by Christopher and Holly Garcia regarding the installation of a 15 foot by 24 foot above ground pool and wraparound desk. Deck. Work is proposed within the border, the buffer zone of the bordering vegetated wetlands. Address is 1 Royal Oaks Way, map 514, lot 12A. Do we have anybody representing the applicant? We have the yes. applicant here. Okay. You can come on up. I'd like to introduce yourself. How you doing? My name is Chris Garcia, and this is my wife Holly. So what, I, I what help you along with this, too? Mm -hmm. Sure. What What is the plan? What do you? It's kind of easy here, but tell us what exactly you're going to do. Well, our goal is to install an above-ground pool on an already level lot that's in the backyard of our house. We have uh, four children from the ages of one and fourteen, and we'd like to take advantage of that opportunity. Okay. Um, I'm assuming these are pictures of your backyard? Yes. Okay. It looks relatively flat, a little slope, but relatively flat. Is the, there's a stone wall in the back. Is that the wetland? That's the wetland. Right, yeah. right on the, the And it says a deck. Is the deck going to be up against the retaining wall side of the pool? Yeah, it would be on the house side, the not side. the wetland side. Okay. Because so I know you guys originally were talking about a wraparound deck, but kind of scrapped that idea. Yes, we would only do half, halfway around. Okay. Okay. Are you going to do any excavation? Because, I mean, it's relatively flat, but pools have to be exactly flat. Are you going to... Raise it up, or are you going to excavate down? If we excavate anything, it would just be the six inches of topsoil as there. Is it? Okay. But you're not excavating anything extremely down to level the pool. Okay. Does the yard slope towards the street? Or? Slopes towards the wetlands in the back side of the house. Towards. When we had um, constructed the house two years ago, we had already put in a pre-existing uh, flat spot right there with the anticipation of hopefully a pool going in. Okay. Alright, well, 
questions. Good question. Um, there is a pitch back there, so it is certainly going to need to be leveled. You mentioned you'd, you'd excavate rather than fill for that. Are you going to haul the excavates off site, or are you planning on spreading them someplace in the yard? I would haul most of it off site. Some of it I would need to touch up some of my bare spots on my lawn. I would use that soil to do that. And but where are those areas? It would be more towards the front side of the house, but it's very minimal. So in the, in the front yard between the house and the road? Yes. In the deck, um, how's that going to be supported? Is that on sauna tubes or what's the nature of the construction for that? I'm going to try to get away from the sauna tubes. Um, they make some, uh, just put some crushed stone down and they make some uh, supporting spots that, because I'm not attaching it to the house, I, I don't have to do the sauna tubes. I can just go right on crushed stone. Oh, it's going to be detached? Okay. Um, and you may not know this yet, but where, where are you going to back flush your filter for your pool? <laughs> I do not know that. I was going to say the same thing. The one thing I was told when I was done mine was that when I do any back flushing, it cannot be head and toe with my brook. It cannot that was, be right. That was what I was going to bring up too. Was, the wet land, you know, yeah. Not throw a hose over that stone wall and do it that way. You do have that grass yard area right. immediately to the right of your yep. home. Yeah. You might have to pump it up, but no um, problem. What do you typically bread? What do you deal with for distance-wise, 50 feet for discharging? It's, it's site specific. Okay. I mean, you, you you have the issues with the chlorine and also with the diatomaceous earth from any filter that can get in there. So as long as that gets filtered out and you allow the water time to dechlorinate before you discharge it, it shouldn't be an issue. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> we need to make sure it gets basically spread on the lawn as far away from the wetlands as possible so it has time to... We have a lot of lawn on the side of our house, so I have no filter. problem pumping it uphill and let it filter up there. And how far from that little stone wall and wetlands do you think, does it say five feet? If I put five hands. feet, I'm hoping it would be a little more than that, maybe seven or eight feet, but it'd be in that ballpark. It's going to be grass, correct? Yep. Yeah. I just, I grew up with the pool and there's a lot of splashing. If it's right up against there again, I don't want chlorine water going directly into the wet, and, you know. You said there's a grass area. You know, it's all grass. Filter as, yeah. as best as possible, so. You know, I would just recommend keeping it as far away from the wetland as <coughs> works for your yard. Any other questions, comments? Liz, do you have anything? No, I, I think you covered it. My concern is chlorine, so. Okay. Brad, you good? I'm good. All right, anybody in the audience like to speak on the snow has been 10? Um, uh, RDA, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> uh, my name's Mark Medanza. I'm the Ward 4 counselor. I happen to live in that neighborhood, and I know the Garcia's very well and I can suggest to the board that all their representations are in good faith and part of all the they good people. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Anybody else want to speak on this notice of uh, this RDA in third and final time? All right. Any objections to closing the public hearing? All right. I declare it closed. Mr. Bengrazi. Recommendations, sir. Yeah, I recommend a negative three determination of applicability for this project um, with the added conditions that uh, the homeowner must maintain a five minimum of a five foot grass buffer between the pool and the uh, stone wall. Um, erosion controls shall be placed on uh, the stone wall line. Uh, I'd like to review that with you before uh, construction starts. So give me a 24 hour notice. And we can line, lay out where the bridge control should go. Um, additionally, uh, no dumping and welding. Okay. And uh, additionally, that the pool, any backwash, be directed to a grassed area, uh, minimum of 25 feet from the well. 
Anybody else have any conditions they'd like to add? Do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, <coughs> the motion that we issue a negative determination for this pool project. Uh, do I have a second? All in favor? Opposed and abstain. You're all set? Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your pool. Thank you. Enjoy your pool. Thank you. Marco will guide you through the way. Don't hold me to that. All right, moving on to our 710 hearing. Pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 131, Section 40, as amended, there will be a public hearing <coughs> to consider a request for determination of lack of ability by Andrew Schaefer regarding the construction of a 120-square-foot 120 shed in yard perimeter fence work is proposed within the buffer zone of a bordering vegetated wetland address 797 union street map 556 lot 5-3 do we have somebody representing the applicant uh, i'll be Please. speaking on behalf of the applicant okay i mean, couldn't attend tonight's meeting um, but we have uh, andrew schaefer from 797 union street um, if you're looking at the map here uh, you have north going towards that you know, Lemster marking on the top of the map here. Okay. We also have Tichico Drive to the south, um, so that's where Lake Samstead is, and mm -hmm. school down there. Uh, it's directly across the street from, uh, I forget the name of the church, but it's a church. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, so what he's looking to do is a <coughs> fence to enclose his entire backyard here. Uh, it's going to be less than six feet tall. Um, However, I wanted to get the commission's uh, opinions on how much space should be left at the bottom of the fence so it doesn't act as a wildlife barrier. Um, he's also proposing a 124 square, 120 square foot shed, um, kind of in the L shape. We'd like that to be on the, uh, kind of like the northeastern corner of the, of the lot, um, closest to the wetland area. Um, it's going to be a crushed stone foundation with uh, some six by sixes laid on two by tens, and uh, it's going to be a pre-built structure, essentially. Uh, I show an erosion control line that will hook around the area of the major disturbance. Uh, you might be using some machinery back there, uh, mini excavator type deal see the wet and line. Uh, it's pretty apparent out in the field. There's all Phragmites, which is you know, purple blue stripe. It dominates that entire wetland area. Is there a, is there, there's a pond, isn't there a pond right there? <laughs> it doesn't show, it oh, just shows swampy area. It's just a swampy area. It's a swampy, yeah. area. Okay. It's swampy depressed area. Oh, uh, further down, okay. Oh, I think the pond you're thinking oh, of is further, further up. up. Yeah. Union Street. Yes. Associated with that. Um, the greenhouse there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So it's down the street from that. Right, and I think there's a house. So, uh, silt fence straw walls are proposed as the erosion control barrier. Uh, I kind of got an idea what the fence is going to look like there. He's going to be that PVC style fence. Where the fence is going is already landscaped. There's nothing. There's yes, no it's going to previous. It's going to remain in the existing lawn area. I don't have any questions or comments. What? Um, you wouldn't happen to know why he's installing the fence. Is it to? It's for a, a dog. dog. He's looking to adopt a dog, so okay. um, one of the requirements is that he has a fenced in yard area. Okay. For it. I mean, I'm, I'm usually uh, I'm in favor of trying to leave it up a little bit to let critters in and out, you know what I mean? Especially being so close to a wetland, but. I know the size of the dog, that's kind of counterintuitive. It's a big dog. <laughs> <laughs> counterintuitive to yeah. that practice, so. <laughs> well, 
I mean, I guess I don't really have a problem with the project at all, with the shed, with the fence, just... That's my only concern, I guess. Sure. So the, the wetlands on here, Marco, mm -hmm. that's this green line? Right. Okay. And you've walked the site? Yeah. Who prepared this plan? I did. You prepared it for the applicant? Yes. I would have used the uh, DEP overlay, but it was way out of whack with the site, so I didn't even show it. Do you know if he's installing the fence or is he having a professional company do it? Uh, he sounded like a weekend warrior type of guy, but I think he might have uh, a company do it. And we don't know if this adoption company has any particular requirements with regard to the fence specification, so if we conditioned it a certain height for the ground, that yeah. might conflict with what they want. I, I can't speak on behalf of that, but I did propose the idea that it would you know, potentially be uh, need, you know, have to be a couple inches off the ground, and said that was fine. But um, you know, ultimately, it's up to the commission. For for wildlife barriers, I mean, typically you want to see a minimum of six inches. Right. But certainly, some dogs can probably. Well, that's, that's why I asked the question. <laughs> right. I mean, if it's a little dog yeah. like mine that's 15 pounds, they're gonna go right under that. But if it's a bigger dog, yeah. You know, I mean, any dog can dig and stuff. So. I mean, as a kind of an animal person, usually they don't specify when you're adopting, you know, they, they just want to make sure that the dog just can't get loose and get into the wild and get hit and stuff. So sure. usually the adoption companies don't specify, you know, it has to be to the ground, but I guess you got to look at the dog and what you're trying to do with it, you know. If you got a digger, it probably doesn't matter the height, but, <laughs> you know. So. No, I guess my own my own concern is I'm I'm comfortable with it as long as we can condition that it's a minimum of six inches. So. Yeah. And I'm just a little concerned with they're on the construction of the fence. I know that's just some post holes. Right. You know, obviously on the lawn side they rake them up and they look them nice, but if it's on the other side and it's in the woods, they might just kind of throw stuff in with it being so close to the wetland. Right. I just be a little concerned. I don't have a problem with the fence just during construction. Sure. When they dig in those posts, what you know, sometimes you end up with a big pile of gravel and like know, a flatter lawn area to do. Yeah. You know, just I on the it. outside of the fence, and you know, yeah, that can be conditioned. You know, mm -hmm. just to make sure that nothing goes into the wetlands and yeah. the gravel and stuff like that. Sure. I have a question. I don't know if it's out of line or what, but when we know there's going to be a shed this close to wetlands. Mm -hmm. Do we concern ourselves with someone storing a lawnmower in there and the possibility of gasoline or anything like that? Being, Could be a good you know concern. what I mean? Okay. So, I mean, is there anything that we... Um, he's going to be storing lawn equipment in there. Um, no doubt about that. So I'll show the lawnmowers. I mean, I think it's far enough away. I'm not really worried about a lawnmower, you know, the amount that's in a lawnmower, but, you know. Yeah, I know they look sometimes at spill radiuses of, you know, three gallons of fuel will go so far. And, sure. You know, um, yeah. I think it's far enough away. That yeah, I'm, I don't I'm think it'll be an immediate impact. If there was a brook right there, I'd right. probably say something, but, you know, yeah. it's, no, that's fine. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Uh, open up to the public. Anybody would like to speak on this RDA? Second time. Oh, sorry. Just a comment. Um, Michael, I wondered if you talked with the applicant about uh, diamond piers for the uh, supports for the uh, shot. You know, I had considered, uh, yeah, I had asked him about what he was going to do for more you know, stable foundation, but you know, he said that's what the plan is called for. Uh, was it like a six inch gravel base? And that's the route he wants to go. 
have diamond pins, you know, a minimal impact. So as a conservation commission in a property that's close to a wetlands area, you might encourage the applicant to use those as opposed to six inch gravel. Sure. Uh, Just a comment. For the record, can you state your name? Oh, Dick O'Brien. Thank you. Resident of Lemonstock. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I would agree with them. I, I think either way is fine, you know. A um, little less disturbance by using those foundations, but I don't want to force force the applicant's hand either way. So. so anybody else like to speak on this notice of intent? And third and final time. Now to clear the public hearing closed, Mr. Bingrazi, do you have any recommendation? Uh, I recommend a negative three determination for 797 Union Street. Um, the added conditions that a the fence shall have a minimum of a six inch gap between the ground and the bottom of the fence. Uh, there shall be no dumping in the wetland in perpetuity and during construction. Um, 24 hour notice to conservation agent prior to construction start for inspection of erosion controls. My recommendations. Uh, do I have a motion? Uh, Mr. Blackwell's recommendations or something else? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we issue a negative determination for the construction of the fence and shed at 797 Union Street uh, per the agent's uh, conditions that he recommended. Do I have a second? second. All in favor? Opposed and abstain. Thank you. All right, move on to our regular meeting. Uh, certificates of compliance, 75 Birchcroft Road. Yeah, I have a certificate of compliance request by uh, Dennis LeClaire. 71 Birchcroft Road, uh, under DEP file number 199545. Uh, this involved the construction of a single family home and a retaining wall next to a uh, perennial stream on uh, Birchcroft Road. Um, this is an old order of conditions uh, issued back in 1997. Um, and it is recently, you know, it's the same property owner that came in under the order, and he's looking to just, uh, you know, release his, his deed. It's not fixed to it any longer. Um, I have a letter from Mackenzie Engineering. Uh, it says, uh, Dear Mr. Bengrazi, the house in retaining wall at 75 Birchcroft Road was constructed and developed. In 1997, in accordance with the original order conditions, DEP file number 199545, and its reference site plans, file ME913 by this office. Please call if you have any questions. Um, per the order, they're only required to provide a uh, letter from a professional engineer saying that the work was completed in um, substantial compliance. Um, I took a site visit yesterday to look at it, and um, there's a retaining wall there, and there's a house there. Um, it, you know, it looks pretty good. So, um, vegetation running in, and all vegetated, and no erosion issues or anything like that that I saw. Okay. I forget, we need to vote on COCs, right? Yeah. Yeah, we do. All right, all right. Any other comments, questions? Do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we issue a certificate of compliance for 75 Birchcroft Road, DEP file number 199-545. Do I have a second? Yes, I'll second. All in favor? Opposed or abstain? Very good. Extension permits. I'm not at this time. Communications. 
Um, has everybody had a chance to review the minutes that Marco sent us for April 25th and March 28th? We can't vote on March 28th. Okay. But we can vote on April 25th. Okay. I have to abstain from that. I wasn't at that meeting. Uh, April 25th. Okay, so we can't. We can't vote, vote on that either. Right. Okay. Okay. We'll go to the next one. Well, for that. I think I missed that one. Didn't I miss that one? I'll put it on the agenda. Yeah, yeah. we'll double check. But, but I'm pretty sure I missed that meeting. Okay. Uh, new business Loop Trail on Conservation Parcel, parcel 160 Chestnut Street. So, good evening and thank you. Uh, my name is Dick O'Brien. I'm a volunteer with the uh, City Recreation Department. I've been asked to come and ask for permission to construct this new trail loop at Barrett Park. And, and we do have a large map here that. Uh, yes, it does. Yeah, it will be. Come so, um, for a number of years, the uh, Recreation Department and the Conservation Commission have been working to complete the network of trails here. Under uh, previous, well, I think going back three open space plans, uh, this area was identified for more effort to complete this trail. The other reason that uh, we're interested in seeing this accomplished is that the trails in the west side of town, <coughs> excuse me, on the city's watershed lands are open to disturbance when the city does forestry work. We're not opposed to the city doing forestry work, but their approach has been to just go in and harvest and basically destroy the trails out of there. And so we have been trying to work with the city to get them to adopt the same policy that DCI, Department of Conservation and Recreation, has, which is to uh, establish a 50-foot buffer on each side of the trail and to take into consideration the fact that the trail exists and to minimize disturbance within that 50-foot buffer. That doesn't mean they can't cut trees, but they basically have to admit that there's a trail there and that their cutting operation needs to take that into account. The city hasn't agreed to do that yet. And so the volunteer group, the Limits to Trail Stewards, who have been authorized to do trail repairs on trails in the city, have decided to focus their efforts <coughs> excuse me, here at Barrett Park and at Prospect Park, Shoaland Farms, areas where the city is not going to do uh, uh, harvesting operations. So that the effort, and it's all volunteer effort, so our volunteer efforts aren't obliterated by a, a, a timber sale. So uh, getting back to Barrett Park, Barrett Park is a combination of both conservation parcels and land under the jurisdiction of the recreation uh, department. Well, given the nature of the property, it makes sense, or it has been uh, sensible to uh, look at developing and managing that as a park, as a, uh, well, it's the city's premier passive recreational park. So the trails here that are solid yellow lines, uh, the trails that are already existing, you know, on your uh, copy that I gave you, you can see these solid yellow lines. In addition, um, new trails, the trails in the dots, are uh, new trails that since that was done have been uh, put on the property. And then there are these uh, dashed lines, which are future trails. The one trail that is under consideration right now in the area that um, I've got circled there 
is the area that is on uh, conservation land. It is a section of this loop trail, basically right in here, in this blue box. This is a conservation parcel. And so going from here to here is a section of trail that we would need your permission. We're talking about a single track, a natural surface, hiking, walking trail. We're not talking about uh, ATVs or uh, gators or a vehicle trail, a simple natural surface walking trail. The tread of that trail is usually 12 to 18 inches wide maximum. There's minimal uh, clearance uh, on the sides of the trail. Um, and basically, as I say, it's, it's a dirt trail. The, the issue here, or one of the issues, you've got an isolated wetlands here with a small little uh, stream here, and we're proposing to cross that uh, wet uh, stream area with a small little bridge. On that, right, in, uh, it's basically a bog bridge. So three foot wide, uh, up off the ground, no more than a foot, uh, resting on uh, either if Judy can find the money for diamond pairs, for diamond pairs, or resting on a six by six pressure treated uh, anchor to the ground with uh, a rebar. So I'm here to answer any questions you might have about that and to see if we can get permission to do that trip. Questions? Uh, I'll start if you'd like. Sure. I have all kinds of questions actually. <laughs> I need to be brought up to speed on a few things. Um, you mentioned the city has a cutting plan for this site? Or no. Plan? No. no. Oh, what I said is the city does cutting on its watershed lands. Okay. It has in the past. And we've had trails uh, in these areas where they've done cutting and those trails have been obliterated. We're focusing our work here because as conservation and recreation land, this land is not subject to the same considerations for forestry operations. You, uh, because of the, the public nature and the recreational nature of this, you probably would never uh, choose to go in here and do a timber stand improvement or a harvest operation. Now the, um, the plan that you gave us, this is very helpful. Um, I can see a number of some streams in there that I, I guess have some, sounds like they have some BBW associated with it. Have you walked this? Yes, I have. You have, okay. So uh, how far beyond the stream channels are we talking as wetland in these areas roughly? Um, well, the stream that you'll see closest to Chestnut Street here, mm -hmm. that's pretty, you know, really it's just bank. Okay. Um, however, when you do come down to that, uh, in that circled area where that, you can see that uh, blue line there, Definitely, it's quite a bit of BBW in there. How, how much of a span do you think for that bridge-ish? I'm going to say no more than 15 feet. Sounds about right. Uh, so yeah, there, there's you know quite a quite a large wetland area down there, but um, like Dick said, it's uh, pretty isolated. In these existing trails in yellow, these are pretty well established and it would be basically the same makeup as what's there or? There, there's a hierarchy of trails here. So for instance, the trail that goes around the pond is a um, accessible trail, eight foot wide, packed a gravel surface. You can ride a bike, you can uh, push strollers on it. You could drive a vehicle and in fact, the recreation department is constantly driving their vehicles on it, much to my dislike. But um, so, so we go from a very developed, to, as we go further out, we're getting more and more um, of a wilderness nature. So this outer loop is meant to be a class one trail, very little development, just for footpaths to, to give uh, the user the, the sense that they're, you know, hiking in uh, a wilderness area as close as we can at this property. So that's, that's the hierarchy. Here, 
Uh, some of these other trails are wider. For instance, the trail that uh, is here that goes up to the top of Gardner Hill, although that's a natural surface trail, it was designed to sort of be wide enough so you could walk side by side with a friend and have a conversation and get to the top of the hill. Uh, whereas this trail, uh, going from here all the way here, is simply going to be, as I say, 12 to 18 inches wide, maximum natural surface, dirt trail. Dick, I have a question for yep. you. Um, on the north side, um, yep. you see that parcel outline in blue? Yes. Um, you're propose are you proposing another trail in there, that dotted line? Not at this point in time. Okay. Um, to complete the trail network, we will eventually come back to you and, and ask for permission to do that. Um, and this is just, what we're trying to do is give uh, users of this property uh, a full experience. If someone wanted to come here and sort of um, hike for a day, uh, you know, they could hike some of these trails in the morning, sit around the pavilions and have lunch, and then go and do the rest of the trails in the afternoon. So trying to, to develop a full range of hiking activities and experiences for the uses that come to Barrett Park. So this would be to try and create, um, at some point we're going to want to put a small, say, four to six car parking area here on Elm Street. So if someone parked here, they could come and do a loop here and, and then head home. So that's the thinking. But, but we're, we're not close to that. Line, I guess that, that could be five or ten years down the road. So now you mentioned a bridge. Yes. Um, since I am new, how, how does that get installed? Um, is that just, is it, is it walked out? Is it? Yeah, you don't use any machinery for that. It's all. No, I mean, we, we build it in place. Okay. So we would cut all of the materials okay. to the site, uh, build it right there. And uh, again, what we're looking at is probably, you know, I, I would say a double uh, two by eight, 16 foot long, three foot uh, wide decking, uh, pressure treated, or if uh, the recreation department can come up with the money for black locust, we do it out of black locust, which is the native naturally rot resistant material, but it's three times the cost of pressure treating. Um, so uh, that would be the type of structure we would have. We want to keep it low to the ground because if you get it two feet or higher, all of a sudden now the building inspector will say, well, you've got to have railings on that. And all of a sudden on this so-called wilderness trail, we have this massive bridge structure that just seems inappropriate. I think I have the idea now. Yeah. If, you, if you go up to uh, the park, you can see there are a couple of bridges, yeah. uh, boardwalks there that are similar in nature. Mm -hmm. um, the, the classic one would be um, the one that crosses the stream right here and leads up to Elm Street. That's a, a simple little uh, boardwalk ac across that stream. So did you have other questions, Brad? Um, I do, actually. I guess in, in terms of procedurally going forward with this, I, I mean, I, th I think what you want to do out here is great. I love seeing this kind of thing on, on public land. Um, I'd probably use it myself. I've been out there in the past. It's probably been a couple of years now, but what's what's there, I vaguely remember. I, yeah. I think I remember when it was recently done around the pond as well. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I guess pr procedurally, are you planning on filing an application with the Conservation Commission for this, or? I don't. Okay. As I say, I'm a volunteer. Um, the Recreation Department would have to file for that. And again, this is a city project. Um, you know, you, you set the, the tone on that. If you require them to file, I mean, would they file a notice of intent on that? 
because there's a, a structure connected with it, or would you? Speak, speaking for myself, um, what you want to do out here doesn't sound too invasive, yeah. um, and I like to keep it as simple as possible for these kinds of projects. I think a request for determination of applicability may be appropriate. Um, I'd like to see the areas that you're proposing the trails. I think once I saw that, I'd, I'd have a better understanding of what I might be looking forward in terms of application. But it, you know, it doesn't sound like you want to do anything too invasive out there. Yeah. Um, I guess the, the one other question I have is you mentioned the accessibility of the trail around the pond. Um, so just for my own sense of trails out here, and, and I've run into this in other communities, um, how do you avoid AAB requirements with these other trails that you're not making them accessible? AAB requirements in ADA do not require every trail to be accessible. There are exemptions for every trail. And basically you look at the, the nature of the land. And if the nature of the land, for instance, the elevation, the change in, in elevation would require a structure that would change the character of the land. For instance, you know, up around the, uh, uh, the north end, that uh, ravine and chasm there. Mm -hmm. If we were to try and go from the base of that up and around it uh, with an accessible trail, we would change the character of that. It would no longer be a sort of wilderness trail. It would be a, you know, a, a colder pond uh, trail. Mm -hmm. And so, um, applicants or, or uh, landowners, anybody who's building a trail has that right to um, make that determination. That they need to assess that and have valid reasons for asking for that exemption. And if they do, um, at this point, no one's challenged that. Uh, and I don't think they could. The law is such that uh, the landowner has that discretion. The difference is if you were um, getting uh, federal funding, <coughs> recreational trails grant funding for this, um, the, the uh, law or the regulations establishing that grant funding require you, wherever possible, to make the trails accessible. But even in that situation, this case, because of the elevational change, there would be a very strong case to be made that because you're like here going up 25 or 30 feet uh, and then over here probably 50 feet, that elevational change would require one so much cost and so much change to the nature of the environment that you could easily get an exemption for it. So I, I hope that answers your question. Uh, basically what I'm saying is we don't have to meet that ABA or ADA requirement on this trail. That being said, I, I'm a strong proponent of making trails as accessible as we can. Uh, but I do think it has to fit the, the purposes and the, the mission of, of the larger trail network here. So that's, I mean, that's why this trail around the pond was made fully accessible. Awesome. All set. Is there, do you have any restrictions on mountain bikes going through those trails? I don't have any restrictions, and I don't think uh, the Recreation Department has any restrictions. The problem is, um, one, I, you know, there's, there's not a lot of I mean, we're not talking like five or ten miles of trails here. Right, no, I've been down almost every yeah. trail there. I, yeah, I, I, um, so no, we don't have restrictions on it. Um, given the increased use by uh, young families uh, and uh, elderly who now can get out on here and walk uh, because the surface is nice and smooth and stable, um, I would uh, consider asking Judy to to put that prohibition in, because uh, the trails on the west side of town, there's tens of, you know, there's 30 miles of trails that are uh, uh, applicable for mountain biking. Any other questions? 
Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Partial Long Hill no hunting signage. Hmm. Yeah, last meeting we had voted on this um, item, uh, but you know, definitely should have put it on the agenda and posted it. And any uh, anybody that felt otherwise uh, could have voiced their opinions. So uh, that's why it's on the agenda tonight. Refresh my memory. This is a. I, I, well, I remember we. we we recommended to take down. That's oh, that's yeah, correct. That's right. That's right. Because right. I remember there was no hunting. And, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is on um, Hill Street. Um, right. Yeah. And so there's uh, quite a swath of conservation land uh, that starts on Hill Street and actually connects to Elm Street on the other side. Um, and there were no hunting signs placed uh, near some residential houses on uh, Hill Street um, that said no hunting this entrance. So that's what the commission had voted on. Um, Mr. Janakis had a narrative for for why uh, he brought it to the meeting. Um, okay. I'm, I'm here to address the, the board on it. Yes, sir. Sure. Again, Mark begins on the Ward 4C counselor. Um, this was brought to my attention by a constituent who lives near the um, site. And uh, when the signs came down, he wasn't sure um, whether it was a, just an act of vandalism or whether there was some, some official action uh, associated with it. So I did a little investigation, and uh, um, <coughs> gave me some information about the meeting that might occur. Um, so my concerns sort of relate to two things, both um, the procedural side of it and the substantive side of it, um, as Marco suggests. It, we determined that it wasn't on the agenda, which, from my perspective, it shouldn't have been acted upon. Um, this matter has some history. It goes back quite a ways. And um, I learned from the constituent uh, that there was an um, opinion from Copeland and Page that was gained at the time about placing the signs. There was some real public safety concerns. Uh, the constituent actually had bullet hole damage to his house uh, and property, which is what prompted it. Um, from the procedural side of it, you know, obviously we would have pr preferred that if it was an agenda item <coughs> that I had been notified as the ward councilor because I would have certainly gotten constituent uh, issues, uh, uh, concerns about it. So that um, is a bit troublesome. And then the other side of it is, is that, you know, that if there had been some notice and some opportunity to present the other side of this equation, um, you would have known about some of the substantive problems that happened several years ago when those signs were placed. So on behalf of the, the constituency as the Ward Council, I would request that the action be rescinded. Um, you know, as a practical matter, if it wasn't on the agenda, it really shouldn't have been acted upon. Um, it really doesn't meet the public, public meeting uh, requirements. Uh, if uh, that is the uh, action of the board, we're back to square one, and if somebody, either Mr. Giannakis or somebody else, feels that this matter requires um, some further action, then it could be established as, a, as, a, as an item, and all parties could have an opportunity to be heard, and um, the board can make a decision based on all the information available as a result of that if somebody feels that this issue needs to be addressed. It, it's, it's late dormant for, I'm thinking this goes uh, back uh, almost 20 years. Um, so it's been, a, it's been there for, it's been an issue that's been decided in essence for a long, long time. Um, I don't know what prompted it to be raised at this juncture, but uh, as I said, um, you know, my, my constituent called me with concern and I share the concern and, and uh, I'm not looking to, you know, create a bigger problem than it has to be, but, um, without it being on the agenda, I think it's pretty clear that it should not have been acted upon. <coughs> okay. Yes, yeah. sir. Sure. Um, this was at the last meeting? 
Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I was not here yeah, for that. Um, so I'm <laughs> not privy to everything that happened with that particular item, but um, I do agree with the counselor. If it was not on the agenda, then we should not have taken action on it. Um, and I would, you know, suggest that we should probably uh, vote on that again tonight. Um, <clears throat> And I guess moving forward, um, I'd like to learn a little bit more about the history of that before I would be comfortable on voting one way or another. So I'm suggesting tonight we, we possibly vote to rescind um, the last month's vote. Um, but to, to go forward from here, I'd like to learn a little bit more about the history of what's there. Um, I've run into these hunting issues, again, in, in other communities, and it, it can be problems for certain homes, certainly. Um, but what I don't want to see is that if there is particular areas of the property that can be hunted on and meet the firearm safety requirements and other things, that we don't somehow lock that all off with signs thinking that there's a complete prohibition from the entire parcel. So I, I think we need to um, get more information on it and have a serious discussion about it. Sure. Good. Did you remove the sign? Were the signs taken down? Yeah, I had DPW okay. uh, remove the signs. Uh, I know at the, at the meeting we did speak about, um, and I'm not super familiar with the, the entire parcel, but there was there was hunting that was allowed, but the signage was only on one entrance, but you can get from the other side. So right. um, unfortunately, my memory is terrible. Oh. I can't remember. Why, why we were talking about the sign, but the sign was only per at one entrance, so other people they could en ex enter the property from another entrance. So it was kind of we didn't. The sign wasn't saying you couldn't hunt; just you couldn't, you couldn't enter. enter at that position. I think at the meeting we've heard a lot of good reasons why the sign doesn't need to be there. Right. But I agree with Mark. Right. We didn't get no, a chance I, to hear somebody tell us why they're right. there. And, and that's fine. So yeah, just yeah. We, I mean, there was a safety concern yeah. brought up, I yeah. think, because if you don't enter from there, you may not know there are houses there. Right. Correct. Right. Um, and that's something they probably don't even realize. They right. So I, I, I think we need to definitely revisit this. Yeah. I agree. And we can do that. But yeah, so Mr. Giannakis basically mentioned that, yeah, you can you can enter from other from the entrances, back. and you can actually walk to that sign and not even know that there's houses right. there. So. We felt that there was no need to have that sign because a lot of people would enter that to hunt from other sections of the, the property. So if there were safety concerns or neighbor concerns, we'd have to look at that entire parcel. You know, because if it has two or three entrances and the sign's only on one, we just didn't think there was a need for that. So, you know, I, I have no problem rescinding the vote when we can get some more information, absolutely. But that, that was our thinking at the meeting, why, why we went that direction. But so I, I agree that along with rescinding it, I think we should revisit it. Not, right. Yeah. Should, not just rescind it and forget about it. I think it. we should yeah. definitely talk about yeah, it. I think it should be well. If there's some safety concerns, it needs to be a, handled a little differently then. So. so do we want to vote to rescind it, or do we want to do something else? I'll start. Um, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we uh, vote to rescind last month's vote regarding the Hill Street Conservation Parcel No Hunting Signage. I'll second. All right. All in favor? Opposed? Abstained. Mr. Chairman, could I just ask that yes, sir. Uh, to uh, preserve the status quo that uh, should the DPW probably throw those signs in I the hope end. not. Um, ask that they be restored. Can't do Marco could work that out. Yeah. And, and I'll sh I get your agenda, so if it makes an agenda, I'm sure I'll get notice of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank yes, you. No problem. Thank you. Um, gray water discharge or <coughs> pet grooming fans. Uh, this was brought to my attention by Mr. Giannakis. Um, he wanted it on the agenda. Uh, so there are some pet grooming vans that drive around the city and they actively discharge their gray water onto the street um, through the grooming process. Uh, so um, I was, that's in violation of uh, city storm water ordinance. So um, I just wanted to notify the commission that I'll be sending them a letter uh, 
requesting that they no longer discharge on city streets or city ways or near catch basements and of that nature to find a nice a grassed area to legally discharge it you know away from wetlands and so forth so uh, anybody has any opinions on that do they have access to the wastewater treatment plant where they could discharge it to at no cost question. or it would likely be at a cost Okay. But I'm not entirely sure how they go about doing that. I mean, I'd rather have them dispose of it. You know, I see the vans, and I, I never kind of never thought thought of it. I thought it was kind of all contained. Right. Yeah, I know, right. like, like an RV, like an RV. Right. Right. And then, I would have never thought of it. You know. Right. Um, <laughs> so I, I, well, <laughs> if, I, if I may, I mean, a couple things. <laughs> it's it's an NPDES violation. You have a discharge into the road, so right. so that part has to stop. So we need to notify them about that. I'm a little concerned about um, what you mentioned discharging onto a lawn area because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure that that's okay as well. I guess so. Um, it, it really should go into a sanitary facility. Okay. That's so yeah, how, how much water are we talking about from these mobile operations? I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no idea. Okay. I started on the agenda. There's all kinds of businesses that will generate you know, certain volumes of roughly that size, you know, whether somebody might have an RV or other things as well. Granted, you have a little bit of black water in there too, but it, this, I, I don't, I'm not comfortable with suggesting that we allow them to discharge it onto a lawn somewhere. That's fine. I can uh, take Mr. Broder's um, direction Just and see. check with the uh, sewer treatment plant and see if um, they're open to uh, private individuals Dump discharging over there. Discharging it, so. Other than that, flush it down a toilet, or I... Has, has right. the uh, health department laid in on this at all? Or they no, I haven't it? gone to the should health department. I would suggest you Absolutely. just check with them regarding a sanitary code, um, just so you know, we're certain that they can't just put it on the ground somewhere, but I, I don't think that this would meet that, so I think okay. it yeah. really should go to... Common sense-wise, it should go to a disposal facility. Right. Sure. And I don't know if there's anything other than the, the treatment plant around town I, I don't know not that i know of and as long as it gets into the proper uh, drainage system sewer system anywhere in town but all right yeah if you could just uh good do a little research a little project and another one and report back <laughs> report back that's what you make the big bucks Mark. <laughs> thank you sir you got it old business seven Seven sixty seven Willard Street driveway discussion. Uh, so I apparently I didn't link this to you guys on last week's email, um, but we do have a we do have a notice um, from Copeland and Page, who is the city solicitor, um, describing the steps that the city can take regarding that driveway. Um, it is a very well written letter. You guys want to take some time and deliberate on it, read through, weigh your options. Uh, I believe City Council, well, City Council had requested this letter from Copeland Page. So um, I'm going to have to get in touch with the City Clerk and see what kind of direction. I was just going to ask if they discussed it last night. I did not have, <coughs> have time to review okay. that meeting, so. I believe they did, actually. Okay. But I don't remember. Okay. Well, I can check with the uh, city clerk. 767 sounds familiar. They've come in front of us, have they not? Yes, they have. Okay. So this came before us um, a couple meetings ago. It's on the uh, corner of Campbellwood Drive and Willard right. Street. Oh, that, that's and right. And drive that driveway goes right across. Over that. Right over that. Right right well, over uh, conservation. Right. Right. Conservation. Oh, the conservation. Right. But right. the house in the driveway was constructed prior to this. Right. Acquiring it, and right, right, right. somehow it, you know, didn't get picked up during the deed transfers and right. all that fun stuff. Um, yeah, I, I would definitely like some time to read that letter. It's a very good letter. I do not want to read that three-page letter about the. No, I don't blame you. Yeah. If we could kind of uh, continue it kind of to the next meeting, maybe. So. Okay, I'll put it on the agenda for next meeting. Yeah. So. 
I appreciate it. You got it. And if, in, in the meantime, if you can just kind of find out what city council kind of come up with. Yep. Would be helpful. So. All right. Enforcement, 723 Willard Street. Uh, so just to provide an overall update of what's going on with this one, um, reached out to the uh, city solicitor that had originally been involved with this and I'm waiting to hear back from them. Uh, for you tonight, I have kind of a revised letter of what was originally sent through the city solicitor to um, uh, Mr. Uh, Dandini. And um, I kind of rephrased things uh, that was recommended by the commission a couple meetings ago. Uh, maybe review it. And uh, I, uh, on the back side of that, I have the original letter that was sent. Uh, additionally, I spoke with the building inspector regarding getting a letter from him. Um, okay, everything jives on his end, so I'm going to have to prod him to get a letter to me you know, regarding uh, you know, the building permits and such that all the lack thereof building permits. So um, that's in the works. Um, so that's kind of like a, an overall update of what's going on. Really not much to, to report, but we haven't heard from his engineer. No, we have not. That was kind of the That was supposed to be at the end of May, right? No. No, that was the next Oh, that was the next that's coming on. I'm getting confused now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the last we heard was what we talked about. <coughs> okay. Correct. That they were working on an as-built plan for, for the site. Um, the commission kind of had some opposition to that. Uh, they want to work towards that. And more power to them, I guess. Um, thoughts? I have a couple thoughts, but <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, we did talk about me confirming with the, the, the building inspector that there was no building permits pulled. Um, I'd like to have that letter just stating that as we discussed. Um, I mean, I can read this now, but I'd like a few minutes to review it. Um, we can put it on the next meeting if there's no objections, just so we. I'd like to have all the ducks in a row, kind of. That's absolutely. Fine. send out. It's a rough draft. I want to. Yeah, I mean, let, let let all the commission members kind of review it, mm -hmm. um, and that way we have some backup to say, you know, we have, you know, there's no permitting and all this other stuff along with, you know, as it says here, you know, you will you will remove it. Um, <coughs> which is kind of what ultimately we we would like to see. Um, so that, that my thought is just to kind of let's finish gathering our information and make sure every commission member has a chance to review. Any other thoughts? I, I um, well, I hate to prolong things. No, no, long, no. So, but. No, real, real quick. Um, you know, we have two things running side by side now for essentially the same parcel, well, the same deed, anyway. Um, I think it's important that you continue looking at both of them together. Um, next month, we should have a more detailed discussion. Um, I'm going to weigh in pretty heavily on both of them. Um, and why I feel pretty strongly in opposite directions on these. <laughs> but I, but I think once you read through, and I, um, Marco did send me the letter from Kaufman and Page. I, I did get to read that already, so I, I know nobody else in the commission has read it yet. Um, a lot of it's what I've already been familiar with. Um, what I'm real curious about, Marco, is the last paragraph we had about the license. That makes absolutely no sense to me. I, I, I have not seen any case history on that, and I'm concerned about precedent there, or who actually has that. Um, authority to grant it. So if you can get a little bit more information on that end of it from the author and um, maybe go from there. Okay. The other thing I'm curious about too, um, getting back to that driveway one, 
is if you could get a copy of the, um, the zoning ordinance that was in place at that time, the driveway section. I was able to read what's what's um, in place today, and I know the house was built long long before then. Mm -hmm. um, it mentions special permits being issued for driveways that go off property or up the property line. So I'm just curious about the history if there was anything else that was granted for that. Okay. Special um, permit wise, and special permit wise for the driveway, or um, yeah, anything of that nature back sure. then because it clearly goes off the property and it doesn't seem to be that there's any easement history there for it. So I'd, I'd just like to know the history of what happens before we make any final decisions sure. on it. Um, I'm uh, for the last paragraph, the one that contact the author, should I request um, some more information regarding the case um, Studies or like how, Spe how specifically that? how that would be handled here, yeah. and has this Thanks been so handled? In if they can give us say, any examples of how this has been addressed in the past in other communities or in this community, because it's Pardon? almost it's almost saying that you know in, in all the other paragraphs it's you've got to go through some pretty big hurdles to grant an easement, and, and I can already tell you what I think the Department of Energy. And, these other committees are going to tell you. I've been through that. Um, they're not going to want to set precedents either. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> thinking that the, the easement part may be a hurdle, I'd like to hear more about the license part of it, but also that seems to contradict everything else that's in place for it. Yeah. So it's, it just seems a little odd that you could have all these pretty restrictive requirements for conservation land, and conservation land is the most restrictive of municipal owned property, and then all of a sudden say, but we can grant you a license, so you're good. Right, you're so that's right. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, definitely, I'll, uh, I'll seek some more uh, explanation on that. How, how old is the house? This was built in two, 1999, okay. off the top of my head. So it's not we should have some information. We should. Get it together I've okay. looked into seeing, you know, if, if they had any special permits for this. I wasn't able to find anything, but I'll definitely drill down and see if I could get any minutes from like city council meetings and, and such. And, and that's really what, you know, particularly with the driveway one, that's really what I'm looking for because I have a lot of sympathy for that particular homeowner at this time. Um, there's a lot of, of different various commissions, people, banks, etc., that probably could have prevented this guy from having, or this person from having the particular problem with right now with the title issue. Um, you know, it could have been stopped at the CO part of it for the house. It could have been prevented when the property was accepted as conservation land. You know, it could have been spotted that it existed there at the time. Things of that nature. So it's not something that all of a sudden the homeowner went and created his own problem mm -hmm. there. It was it was in existence before the parcel was accepted by the city, and that's at least personally that's why I have a lot of sympathy for what they're going through there, and I'd, I'd like to try to do what we can for them. Mm -hmm. um, the other one, maybe I have a little less sympathy for, but we'll talk in more detail on that one too. Okay. Cool. You good. All right, so we want to we pull Willard Street off to the next meeting and we'll get some more info. Yep. Perfect. <laughs> Harvard Street, 375 Harvard Street. So, um, a little back story on this one. DP file number 199781, expired September 13th, 2015. Uh, this is the one you were thinking of. Mm -hmm. With uh, We gave them... This has been going on for a year now, and uh, we have given them until the end of May to, you know, get a botanist out there, wetland scientist, um, and a site walk with permission. I contacted Mr. Damasa uh, two Fridays ago um, just to check that after I had sent him a certified mailing letter, uh, you know, reminding him of uh, you know, what he agreed to at a prior meeting, 
for this. Um, so I talked to him two Fridays ago. He assured me that um, he's going to have Whitman and Bingham. They're going to have a Whitman scientist on site before May 31st. I requested that, reiterated what was in the letter, I requested that he involve me in the scheduling of that site visit um, so that if any interested commission members um, were interested in attending, that they could do so. Um, he called, uh, Mr. DeMasa called me at uh, 3 o'clock today and told me that uh, he wouldn't be atten able to attend the meeting, um, but he assured me that within 60 days we will have a report from Whitman and Bingham uh, regarding the, the wetlands and that he had flagged the wetlands that have gone out there to confirm that the wetlands have been flagged. Um, I can do that tomorrow, but um, you know, it was a last minute you know, phone call uh, regarding it. Um, I asked them to give me an email, he couldn't do that. So, so we don't have any written correspondence, this is just phone calls? Phone calls. So take that as you will. Um, so this is what we got, you know, uh, before May 31st we were supposed to be out on site, we weren't. Uh, it's been being pushed another two months in order to get a letter regarding this. I provided some of you with kind of a, I don't know if you got one, I'll get you one. It was kind of like a map that Wyndham and Bingham had provided us. A little narrative from uh, Wyndham and Bingham regarding you know, their methodology for, for calculating the disturbed areas. So well, this is last year. I'm looking at Tuesday, June 14th. This is June 14th. Like of 2016. Right, right, right. So that's I'm how old thinking this it was. I was thinking it was this morning. Was no, like, and that's, oh, okay, that's, and that's how right. old this is yeah. going on. So, <laughs> right. right. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty inclined to have no sympathy nor allow any more extensions or time frame to do anything <laughs> on this. So, I, you know, I guess my question is, is where do we go at this point? Because I absolutely would not say, I'll give you 60 days. <laughs> yeah. That's not that's 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 unacceptable. Yeah. So, where do we go from here? So, what, where do we go at this point? You know? He didn't give a reason for 60 days. Yeah, no reason for 60 days. But his, the reason, I guess the reason was that he would get us a plan for the more concrete plan, more concrete yeah. plan other than this you know, disturbed area type. Right. Just for clarification, where did this plan come from? That was from Whitman and Bingham on June 14th of 2016. So, and underneath that plan is the original plan for the order conditions that was approved. The one that shows the building and the, um, the burn water management system. And the, okay. Yeah, that was the limit of grading and all that stuff. So this this shaded area, um, you know, all all the all the language that's on here, this is from the, the owner's consultant. Yes. So Whitman and Bingham is indicating that there's a potential alteration of s close to 70,000 square feet. Right. Um, it's likely less than that because they had put in erosion controls. You can see that erosion control line. And they could cut it through a wetland. They didn't fill through there, but that's what they're including in the potential alteration statistic. There. But the, I mean, that's. That's significant. I mean, you're talking almost 14 times what's allowed under 401. Sure. So, I'm just thinking, you know, if this drags on, other potential enforcement options, that's all. Sure. Right. Okay. Any other questions? So, for what, I guess, what are our options? Do we, do we know what our legal options are at this point? I can't speak on behalf of that, but you know, out in the open, we could wait 60 days, see what they provide us, right? Or as Brad said, find another avenue to go. You know, um, as far as enforcement. Um, what is that other avenue? Uh, DP, I guess. Well, but this, I mean, this, this. Um, when when did this alteration take place? Oh, it was like two months after I started, so 
it's been going a on longer than a year. It's probably two years in the making. I think it started in, when was the, I have the enforcement order here. Let me just start with that. How much disturbed land are we talking about in total, roughly? Sorry, what was that? How much disturbed land, roughly, would you estimate? In terms of all the earthwork that was done out there, not just yes. wetlands, but? I would say, so take the, let's see, take that 22,685 square foot, which is in the, the eastern corner of the property there. Okay. That one. So take that one for sure. Yep. And I would say half of this 45, five. Oh. And upland portions of the site, in terms of, was that disturbed at the same time, or? Yes. So, we're talking more than an acre anyway? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Additionally, Brad, there was, on the so northern side of the, if you look on to the north, there's that, this is approximate location of wetlands not yet delineated. Um, sorry, it should be on the left side of the plan. Way over here on the top. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, there had been vegetation cutting in there during the same time frame um, of this, and apparently there were there were enforcement orders for that specific wetland area. Any additional permits issued for the site that we know of from the city? <sighs> Two years ago, there weren't any, but that could have changed. No building permits, um, no so building, but there, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to check into that, if there are any. Like, yeah, I, I, no, there's no building there, but I was just curious if they've done the permanent part of it. Um, what about the stormwater bylaw? Is there anything ever issued under that? Uh, no. <coughs> this is Harvard Street? This is Harvard yeah. Street, so. City, city owned, part of the MS4. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Does, I mean, I personally, I'd, I'd like to see the the owner just cooperate and evaluate it and do whatever needs to be done to fix it. Um, but if we don't get anywhere, it, you know, there's at least a few options I can think of. So let's let's hope that they respond this time, I guess. And then if not, you know, I'd be happy to discuss all the options. I'd like to show them that 60 day time frame though. I'd like to go to at least 30. Because they've had, I feel, ample time to, I mean, they had from November till May to hire an engineer mm -hmm. and to get them out there. Mm -hmm. So whether well, the engineer walked out there on May 31st, that was our deadline to be here, to be with a plan. With a plan. So I am definitely not inclined, and that, that's what I'm saying. I don't know what. Uh, legal, you know, can we just say you got 30 days, you got 21 days, you have something, you know what I mean? But you, you, we've already notified them in writing to give us XYZ, let's say, yeah. correct? And they haven't responded to that, correct? Right. And we're talking not just months, but over a year at this point. Correct. Okay. So to get back to that, it, uh, February 4th, 2016 was when this enforcement order had gone out. Uh, so, you know, a year and a couple months. Uh, but uh, I could definitely send a certified letter reiterating that that we, the commission feels that we have provided, allowed the uh, property owner ample time and that we'd like to shorten the, the uh, time frame for, for plan and response to, to our uh, inquiries, you know, uh, whether or not if you feel 60 days or 30 days or, I don't know. 60 days from the th March, May 31st date is what they're asking for? Yeah. So they're asking for July 30th. Yeah. My personal opinion, I'm fine with that only because I know how busy the surveys are this time yeah, right now. So I, I so but that would be six weeks away, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Again, I'll reiterate with a certified mailing. Uh, 
Yeah. I, I'm i just a little nervous that it's July 31st comes and we get, well, here's our plan, but it doesn't really address anything. And then we're back here again, and then it drags on until November, and then we're back, you know what I mean? It's at some point, the construction season to do replications and click is dwindling fast. Faster well, than we're before. past that point now. Um, so if we're going to be doing any replication work, you're looking at doing that in the fall growing season anyway. Right. Yeah. So, so that would require new notice of 10, correct? If well, you can do that under an enforcement order. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's up to the commission. I'm, you know, whatever route they feel, whether it's a, a notice of intent or the enforcement order, I'm comfortable with. I could go either way on that. Yeah. Um, but legally, legally, you can do it under the enforcement order. Okay. Because yeah. if if they take the full 60 days, that brings us to July 30th. You know, we have our first meeting two weeks after that in August. If they wait till the last day, that leaves two months for them to fix this problem before. Maybe three, depending on weather. And, or we wait a whole nother, almost a year. Well, like Brad said, it's so, probably going to have to wait another year anyway before site work really does happen for replication. I personally, I'd like to see it happen in the fall. In the fall, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I, that's, I can understand where uh, that's my fear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get you. I, I want this. Well, comes up back. closed. Yeah. Oh yeah, no. right. I mean, it, you know, people right. think summer just started, but construction season ends Halloween, mid November. So True. that's really not that far away. No, it's not. So that's that's the problem with. I mean, it's six weeks away. I mean, it sound you know. I'm thinking if it's thirty days, that would give until June. That's two weeks. Yeah, they're probably not going to have something for us in two weeks. But come July. You know, I would definitely like to communicate with the property owner that come July 31st, if you have nothing, there will be immediate action on the commission's part. And, and you know, what that is, I, I, I'm, I'm not the legal guy here, so I, I don't know. You know, I'll leave it up to you, to you guys that know better sure. what that next legal action step is. but. I, you know, I, I, I don't want to come August, whatever our meeting is in August, to say, well, here's our plan, and then we decide we don't like it quite right, and then it gets <laughs> pushed and pushed and pushed. That's kind of, you know. That's a good point. You know, so. Do we want to just sit and No, wait? I agree that the language should be a little bit more stern than, you know, okay, fine, we'll give you the 60 days, but. That's we're done, you know what I mean? Yeah, we're done giving you the 60 days. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, what is what is your guys' thoughts if something just isn't right come July 31st? What is what is the next? Well, if, if they if they haven't responded, um, there's, there's two options that I would suggest that we look into to start with. Um, that's one, to see what the city's appetite would be um, to pursue it in court. That's one option right. to get them to comply with the enforcement order. The other option is to, um, these are the, again, the first steps would be to defer to the central region at the mm -hmm. Department of Environmental Protection. Um, because from an enforcement viewpoint, if, if this particular plan, um, you know, even if it's only a, a portion of this amount of alteration, they'd probably be interested in it. Um, I, I can tell you they're, they're pretty busy now. The small stuff they probably don't want. Something like this, yes, this, this, this is significant. 40,000, yeah, you're talking least, an acre, right. at least. Yeah, yeah, I, it, it's, yeah that's, I mean, that's, I mean, once, 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 you you start, once you start, especially once you get over 5,000 square right. feet, um, they get interested in it, and for various reasons. I mean, I don't, I don't want to get into those and right. how they think, but I know how they think. So, right, right, it, right. There's, there's different approaches to whether or not they'd want to, they'd want to pursue it. And they certainly have more experience and better abilities of enforcing these enforcing, things than, yeah. than local. I mean, I guess, do. I guess that's what I'm trying to do is yeah. figure out. You know, I just don't, don't want to keep saying, you know, slap on the wrist saying. You didn't it, do what we well, asked at some the, point. The reality is, is there's only so much that this commission can do on, on the enforcement level. Correct. But it doesn't. It doesn't mean that um, 
our ability to, to try to get them to comply with the Rutland's rigs is gone at this point is that there's other options. So. Okay. All right. I guess we'll be ready come July 31st. All right. We'll leave it at 60 days with a follow-up letter and yeah. communications both sides of the uh, table here. Yeah. And if they get us something sooner, that's even better. It gives you a chance to review it and <coughs> just comment on it or, or raise any red flags. So. Are we good on those topics? Uh, Lewis Knock Brook, retain wall. Um, so Manning Avenue, we have a retain wall that had collapsed back in April. Yep. Beginning of April it collapsed. Um, this is a, it was a stone wall, it's old school construction. Collapsed, fell in the brook. Uh, as you all know, there's some Jersey barriers down there now with riprap embedded into the side of the banking there uh, to act as a temporary um, you know, support for the wall. I have revised the emergency cert uh, a little bit to take into consideration. Um, I know uh, Mr. Stone had mentioned uh, removing some sediment as a stormwater maintenance item to compensate for the uh, riprap that we had placed in there uh, because that's all floodplain down there. So. Uh, definitely take burden off of the culvert and off of that compromised section of the wall. Um, I, Brett, do you have any comments on that? Um, I do. I'm reading it for the first time tonight. Um, but I have some concern with the language for a number of reasons. Has, has everybody read this yet? Or am I no, it's, it's, okay. it's only yours. All right. Why don't, why don't I read? just this uh, paragraph on the work to be allowed then. It says, remove wall debris from stream, install concrete Jersey barrier wall in stream to divert water flow. Backfill Jersey barrier wall with riprap stone and compact riprap into bank to fortify the wall. Work shall also include the removal of accumulated sediment islands within stream to compensate for flood storage lost from the riprap fill into further direct water flow away from compromised wall. Um, <clears throat> a few of my concerns with the certificate worded the way it is. Number one is we haven't really defined um, a time frame for a permanent fix yet. Um, <clears throat> my experience in municipal repairs is that quite often temporary becomes permanent. And we really can't, in my opinion, allow this to remain permanent the way it is because it doesn't comply with the rutland regs in a number of areas. It should be ultimately have a permanent fix. I know you mentioned they may be entertaining the idea of repairing the entire wall and doing other things there. Um, I'm certainly sympathetic to the city's position that you can't just grab the amount of money tomorrow to, to fix something like this in most cases, but it's not something that I'd be comfortable with sitting there you know, for two years from now either. So there should be some <coughs> discussion amongst the department heads, wherever the finances are coming from from this, and try to at least come up with a timetable to see when this can be done. And if it, if it needs something from us indicating that it's required, um, or you know, if anybody feels differently, they can speak tonight too. I'd, I'd like to hear from anyone else. But it's it's something in my mind that can't simply stay the way it is. It needs it needs to be addressed. Oh, sure. um, but I also understand that you, you just can't go do that tomorrow. The way this is worded also is that, and, and I I was the one that brought up um, after my site visit potentially removing some of the sediment deposits there that have come from not the wall collapse but sources upstream, mm -hmm. um, erosion things of that nature, as well as. Um, deposits near the culvert because it's pretty common is in a lot of these um, looks like a box culvert although it's hard to yeah. see from where I was standing. A lot of times you do get those doubles <coughs> that form and what happens is the, the water diverts, you get some backwater at times and, and all of a sudden in the larger storms you've got the water hitting the walls and the foot ends 
and it's causing problems in the wall rather than going through the culvert like it's designed to do. So some housekeeping measures to be done there um, just to protect the integrity of the repair as well as the culvert in the future. Um, I guess I'm okay doing that under the emergency cert. Um, the other option is, in my mind, a request for determination of applicability. Um, I'd be fine either way. I certainly wouldn't suggest a notice of intent for this. But the way the way this is worded here um, in the emergency certification form, where it says to, to, to remove it to compensate for flood storage lost, that's not really what this is doing here because the flood storage lost is at completely different elevations. Sure. And in order to comply with the regs, you have to do that at like elevation intervals. So the sediment's coming down. If any of you have been to the site, the sediment that's being removed is essentially within the stream um, during low flow. Some of it's just barely above the water level, whereas this fill is many feet above that. And all of that fill is still within the floodplain. And the floodplain there actually goes up above the parking area. So if you can kind of visualize that, and, and that's why it's hard to it's hard to visualize why the flood maps might be right in a lot of areas, but if, if you if you look at it, um, it, it would overtop onto the parking lot there. So that like whole area, feet. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that, and it and it could happen. I mean, I, I haven't seen the the hydrologic hydraulic analysis on it, but that's sure. you know intuitively you look at it and say, sure, I can see that happen. No, right? But but to comply with the regs. Um, it would have to come out at the same elevations. And this is almost, the way this is worded, it's almost indicating that um, by removing the sediment in the stream, they've, com they've complied with the flood um, storage loss for the repair. And that's, that's not really, um, I'm concerned that the wording of this, if we sign this, it's almost essentially saying, we're okay with what you did, you've complied with everything, go to it. Okay. Um, so completely get rid of the flood storage narrative and just go with uh, good housekeeping and that's I mean I'd like to hear from everyone on their opinions on that but it's like I said you could do that under an RDA in my mind I've, I've you know I see those all the time in, in a few communities um, <clears throat> I'm okay with doing it under the emergency certificate because I think the repair made that worse so let's quickly try to try to do that and if and if it means a site visit with DPW, I mean, I'd be happy to go out there and kind of show them the areas I'm thinking of as well. Or if you've already done that, then, then I've great. I've done that, but I would you know, definitely rope you in on uh, further uh, correspondence with it. I know I'm meeting with the mayor tomorrow and with Charlie Coggins, uh, emergency management, and uh, we're even seeing with DPW to discuss the culvert there and the wall itself. So uh, we are definitely going to be having dialogue with among department heads on what's going on down there. So, um, you know, I'll definitely rope you in on any, uh, any correspondence that you have a lot of good input on it. So, they have. So, if I remember, we talked about the sediment because it was, because of the new diversions, it was building up sediment in areas that it normally wouldn't have built up sediment. And that's what we were talking about removing. Am I, am I right? That it was causing like an eddy in an area or something and depositing sediment there. And that's what we wanted to. Kind of overall, the deposited sediments have acted in a way that was probably resulted in the, the, the break, breaking of that wall, I guess you could say, over the years because it had. Okay, so we're, we're, all right, but that's. I thought we were talking about something after where the repairs were done. The way the repairs were done was causing a new sediment my, barrier. My thought on the sediment removal was twofold. One, get get the deltas away from the culvert inlet okay. to protect the, the, the wall that's starting to be compromised there. You can see where it's starting to get yeah. away at the foot and at, right at the the, um, the upstream end of that culvert. Okay. And, and two, the sediment in the stream adjacent or in, in the area adjacent to the repair work that was done, just to increase the cross-sectional area of, of that channel when okay. you do get the higher events, because it, it you know, it, as you mentioned, it did constrict it quite a bit, mm -hmm. and yeah, now you've lost that. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, so it's like both. So, did you, did you witness the construction of the repair being done? Yeah. Did, did they put fabric underneath that riprap? No, they didn't. No, just, they didn't? No. Okay.
So you have a meeting tomorrow there? Yeah. Not there, but well, to discuss that. Can we, um, I guess, can we, well, could you reiterate our concerns at that point of timeline and not a, I'm not a, a floodplain expert, but I probably agree with Mr. Stone of removing the sediment really doesn't count as floodplain storage. So. Sure like to get that out of there if that's kind of not right you know because that's kind of what I thought of is because I know there was a velocity issue the, the culvert and all that other stuff and I wasn't thinking too much on the flood thing it's more of a narrowing yeah region. yeah 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 so okay. yeah I'll rephrase that and if you can give us an update obviously by the next uh, next meeting hopefully you can Awesome. So I'm sure you won't have a date of final repair from your meeting tomorrow, but at least oh, no, maybe a, a direction anyways. Yeah, and yeah, I'll definitely uh, express the commission's concerns about why <coughs> it is an issue. We'll leave it as as it is. Yeah. Okay. The sooner the fix, the better. Right. That type of stuff. Just give them some of your pain to fix it. It could be good. Right. <laughs> Anything further on that? Good. Okay, that's good. Okay. 290, 298 Central Street. Yep. Uh, this came before us a couple weeks ago. Uh, DEP file number 199 1046 under a order conditions for two house lots uh, that are being converted into a uh, repair facility for yep. electric vehicles and such. Uh, so the commission had some concerns about the wetland flags and wetland boundaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you're familiar with all that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Got a letter floating around here somewhere. <laughs> so I went out to the site um, on May 15th with uh, Chuck Karen with Karen Environmental. Um, and just to review uh, wetland flags A6 and A7 out on the site. So he, I have a letter from them regarding our site visit and uh, you know what how he feels about the, the flags. Uh, starts off, dear Mr. Bangrazi, on May 15, 2017, we conducted a site visit to examine the wetland delineation specifically in the area between flags A6 and A7 on the corner of the old garage on the site. It is my understanding that at least one member of the commission had requested that we take a second look at this area. This portion of the site was historically disturbed and heavily utilized. The soils are disturbed in the past throughout almost the entire site. They have been in place for a long enough time for soil features such as modeling to have developed. In many locations, the soils were likely compacted due to the activities on the property. In the area in question, there is a mix of upland and wetland vegetation, including sensitive fern, horsetails, silky dogwood, sedges, wood aster, upland goldenrods, and deer thumb grass. The soil in that location is similar to a deep A horizon in both the upland and the wetland. Uh, the matrix color is 10YR22, and that's a very dark brown. The soil within the wetland, as delineated, has greater than 5% modeling, and the models have both high and low chromas, beginning below a depth of about 8 inches. Within the area in question, the soils have far less than 5% modeling, and only high chroma models are present. We observe small pieces of brick within the soil, and it's possible that these are mim mimicking modeling. Deep soils, A horizons, are considered to be hydric when they have a chroma of two or less, have greater than 5% modeling, and when high, <coughs> when high, when both high and low chroma models are present, the modeling criteria need to occur within the upper 12 inches of the soil profile. According to the soil conditions that we observed on this location, in this location, confirming that the delineation is correct. If you have any questions in regard to this matter, please feel free to contact us. So that's kind of the narrative of our site visit. Um, you know, uh, again, it was when we had taken the soil samples, we were looking at some pieces of brick. Um, 
and Chuck's opinion that the button flag as shown on the original plan is correct. If anybody has any comments on that, or I can provide a copy of this letter or review it further. That was part of the conditions of the order conditions that we so, yeah. review it. So there was some wetland vegetation present, but the soil right. didn't. Was it hydric? Hydric, yeah. It's a mix of upland and wetland vegetation. Yeah. Comments? I guess I don't. I'm not a soil expert, but neither am I. If there's wetland vegetation there, I know it's a combination of both. It has to be both. I just it has to be more than fifty percent wetland vegetation. Yeah. Did he say if there was both? He just said it was combination of combination. He didn't specify. He didn't, specify. He didn't do like a. Um, you know, personally, I feel comfortable with it. Okay. Take that worth the grain of salt, but you know, uh, it's pretty. It was a pretty good site visit. Okay. Obviously, there was more vegetation probably when you were there than when we were there. Right. There was when we originally viewed it. We were looking at sensitive fern. Right. And those are kind of like red maples, I guess you want to call them. You know, kind of found right. everywhere. Um, so. Yeah. Your thought, your thought is, is it's borderline, if not upland. I'd say it's borderline. Um, I, the delineation on site, as shown on the plan, was Pretty very accurate. close. Okay, if not there, in my opinion. Okay. Comments? I'll take your expertise. I appreciate that. <laughs> so. <laughs> You know, more <coughs> than, 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 than I do. So, I mean, I you know, I had questions, but you know, the vegetation was a little less then than it is now. I'm sure. So, I'm sure. if you say yeah, you're good, I would. I'll follow your lead on that one. Any other comments, Mr. Just, Stone? Sure. Just general one, not necessarily specific to this particular project, but um, it sounds to me like. The commission issued in order conditions for this at the last meeting that we had? Uh, not the last meeting. Right? No, it was the last meeting. Okay. I wasn't yes. there for it. But there was no, it wasn't the last meeting. Or the last meeting was canceled. The last right. scheduled meeting was canceled. So it was Okay, so the last that's meeting. what I'm thinking. Yeah. We're back a month. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay. I, I was not here for that one. Okay. Um, and it sounds like. The order was issued with the condition that the wetland line still be evaluated, or yeah. pretty sure that's how we had worded it. Was that yeah. I know I issued the order conditions. So okay. That's a fact. Um, and part of the uh, conditions was that if they have a wetland scientist review that line, and upon review, I know it's not the practice we. Yeah, I mean, I'm personally, I I'd be uncomfortable. Um, Closing a public hearing and voting on something that we're still continuing to take information for. Um, I know that you know a number of conservation commission members actually attended the site walk. We met with them. We expressed concerns. One of those concerns was the wetland delineation. It's really up to um, uh, the, the client's representative to get out there and quickly try to address any concerns that we have and have that ready for the next meeting. If they don't, then I wouldn't. Be comfortable voting on it at that time. And that's sure. the position I would have taken had I been here. Um, not only do you preclude the public from comment and other open meeting law things at that point, um, you're also getting into this cycle of well, who's right, who's wrong, but we've already closed and issued a decision. Right. It doesn't make much sense to me. It sounds like if, if anybody has a concern on a particular thing, you should probably get that ironed out before you vote on it. Um, <clears throat> and like I said, we've we've gone out of our way to do the site walks, meet with them, get these things kind of pointed out before we get back in here. So we're we're doing everything we can on our part to 
try to keep the timetable to move along. I know people want to get going with their projects. So as long as we're doing that for them, I think they should try to quickly get us the stuff as well, rather than suggest we close something and let's look at that later on. Um, you know, just my personal take, I wouldn't be comfortable, you know, voting in that type of manner sure. on a future similar project. I'm, I don't really want to debate this one any longer. It sounds like you've looked at it. You're not really upset with it. It really doesn't affect the project. The only thing I was thinking of is any future projects. Um, you know, clearly, clearly that line didn't make or break what they were doing out there today. Um, and I, I, think, I think it's pretty low risk that they'll want to do something there in the near future anyway. But so it is what it is at this point. Yeah, sure. No, I completely understand it. Yeah, too, but I, I think that's isn't that what we kind of came up with was because you're not doing anything along that line we're okay with going ahead but we want it to be confirmed on the we did on not, plans for future we did not accept the, the wetland the, line right we said so we wanted that to find better for future in yes. case something later happens we wanted a better line that was we wanted to we did not accept that wetland line at all at all so I think well I I, I would have I, I get what you're saying. I, I, I kind of agree with you, but yeah, I think that was that was. I think it was just that yeah. section we did not accept those yeah. guidelines. Right. Okay. I, you, but you I can't don't, remember. You now. don't want to get into the situation too, where well, if some guy went wild with the bulldozer next week, and well, the commission never confirmed anything here. We don't think that this was wet now. Right. 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 Yeah. No, I think we were very specific of the area that we would not accept until it was confirmed or denied. And I think the so, issue was... Yeah, it was only two flags, I think. We that's had. correct. Right. Right. The consultant was in Florida the day of the, like, before even being able to review that line. Yeah. So, you know, I, I see both sides of it. Yep. And for future, yeah, we you take that into consideration. Yeah, consider that. Yeah. So that's what we got for this one. Yeah. So, we could go ahead with it. Letter on file and okay. go from there. Budget. I do have an update on the budget. Oh my god. I know. <laughs> wow. Stay in your seat for this one. Okay, so uh, I have a email from uh, the controller. Um, one of the uh, shell canado with Comptroller's office and uh, CC John Richard on it. Uh, John had requested that she review the wetland account and the funds that I have put into it. Um, so the email says, Marco, I reviewed the wetland fees account and here's the information you requested. Uh, ending balance as of June 30th, 2016 was $61,805.22 and that is what I had on my um, spreadsheet. Uh, next, FY 2017 deposits as of March 17, 2017 was $7,230, and that is what I have deposited. Um, so you have a new current total of $69,035.22, uh, $69, and that corresponds with my spreadsheet that I have. Um, so as of now, well, as of March 17, 2017, the wetland account is up to date and reflects all deposits made into it as of last fiscal year and this current fiscal year. Okay. Uh, questions, comments? Question, yes. I got bored and read the annual report one night. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> under the Conservation Commission, there is there was a section for ads or advertisements. It was a few thousand dollars anyway. What is that for? So this is how it has worked. <laughs> well, this is how it was in the past. Is that legal ad fees are an appropriate line item? Um, doesn't. Uh, the way our budgets work is it doesn't necessarily have to be all committed to legal ad fees. Um, what happens is, what did happen in the past was that we would get legal ad fees in and 
they were deposited into the wetlands account. Um, I had discussed that with the comptroller and I wanted to change that because technically they're not really, it's, it, the way it goes is I pay the Sentinel on an invoice that they provide me. So that's where the legal ad fees goes from, from my line item goes to the Sentinel and Enterprise. The way I thought, thought it was, well, if we get those legal ad fees, shouldn't they go back into a city account, not necessarily the Wetland Protection Act account? Because those aren't really wetland fees, those are right. legal ad fees. So that's something completely different. Um, so to answer your question, I get an invoice from Sentinel Enterprise. I pay that invoice. I then get a check from a, you know, the, the applicant to cover their legal ad fee because I send them an invoice. Um, so that gets posited into a uh, separate account other than the weather protection account. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that, I mean, that was part of my concern. <coughs> I want to make sure that we were actually collecting the money from the applicants for that because they are they are responsible we are. for it. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. It's just a appropriated item so I can pay the invoice and then invoice individual applicants to get that money back. That's how it's worked. So if it's if it's appropriated for legal ads, comes from the general budget for that, and you have, for instance, a DPW project. You're not then billing them. You're just okay. Yep, like this board of health one, I probably not going to bill the board of health for it. But quite you know, something I could do. So it's not something that was budgeted out of our filing fees before. No. So, okay. Just kind of. Yep. No, then that's fine. Use it for whatever in the budget. I couldn't get all that from reading the report. No, you usually don't. Yeah. yeah. So. Any other questions? Good. Agents report. Uh, we need to pick meeting dates for June and uh, July and August. We typically have done one meeting in July, one meeting in August. Uh, if anybody has a preferred meeting date for those, I kind of I, so for July we could do we're going to do the second and fourth Tuesday. We could either do July 11th or July 25th. Um, and for August, we could do August 8th or August 22nd. So maybe you know, think about those and get back to me by the next meeting to have that shirt up. Well, the next meeting would be July. So no, I want to let you know on that one. Our next meeting is June 27th. Oh, okay, you're right. I was getting we had one more this month. Yeah. So, if you guys want to take some time to see what your schedules are looking like, we can go with that. I cannot do trial on that sometimes. Okay. You well know, but that doesn't stop. Mr. Stone is stepping up if need be for that, if the commission decides. The other dates are fine with me, so. Okay. You check out in the August, but. All right. I don't take vacation, so don't worry about me. Okay. <laughs> so we'll talk. Not, not in the summer, that's for sure. You got time to hike the trails, though. That's good. Yeah, there we go. Those are small vacations. <laughs> All right, we'll make a decision at the next next meeting. That way, it'll be in place. So, uh, anything else? Uh, no patron books. Okay. Uh, do you have like one more minute of our time? Go ahead. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I'm I'm just noticing this now, and I've noticed it's been on other agendas as well. Sure. But now that now that we have three RDAs and, and no NOIs, is there any specific reason why we're advertising the RDAs as a public hearing instead of a public meeting? Um, no, I'm just doing what it was done in the past. I didn't realize that it could be. There there is a difference. The request for information applicability requires a public meeting. It does not require a public hearing. Okay, public So meeting. I guess my next question is we're not requiring the butter notifications for IDAs, are we? No we're not. Okay. Because that's also part of it as well. So we yeah. Okay. I just don't want to mislead people into thinking that something on the agenda is truly a public hearing when it's not because there's different repercussions for those. I will make sure that does not happen in the past. But in the future. 
I guess what's what is the difference between a public hearing and a public meeting? <coughs> well, in in what in the wetlands cases, it's going to mean a public meeting requires that you you advertise it in the newspaper, you mm -hmm. post it on the agenda two days in advance, and you open it up to the public. It doesn't require that you. Um, Give them a voice, for instance, okay. at it. <laughs> However, I want to I want to stress <laughs> clearly that with with RDAs, I am personally in favor of continuing to give the public a voice on that. Sure. But it, it can mislead them into thinking that, um, for instance, the appellant rights, things of that nature, that they, they might not specifically have um, that type of thing. Or or if it gets, um, let's say even remotely controversial, I guess, and it's taking two hours of your time. If you want to cut them off, you have, the, you have that. We can cut them off. To okay. do that. For a hearing, it's, they have right. the right to. For a hearing, you, you want to give them a voice as long as they're as not long as saying takes. the same thing 20 times over, let them speak. Right. Um, okay. <clears throat> and I could also see somebody after the fact saying, uh, we want to know what they're not going Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So if they see a public hearing on here yeah. and, and they've, for instance, somebody's filed a notice of intent next to them in the past, and they see, well, why wasn't I notified about this yeah. one? And they're going to be after him, hopefully. Where a public meeting is a little bit more. Okay. okay. Right. So. All right. Good point. I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yep. Chair's report I have nothing. Uh, our next meeting is June 27th, 2017, and filing deadline is June 15th. Anything else? Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>